Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And today I'm joined by David Sherman. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Let's start at the most basic level as we're going to be talking about SPACs today. Could you explain to our audience what SPACs are and how they even work? Sure. Uh, We have actually just come out with a cartoon called SPACs 101 that maybe you can download to your group, which I think will explain it probably a little clearer than what I'm going to now. But SPACs are a publicly traded company that were issued with an IPO where the money that was raised for the IPO, the cash, is put into a trust account for the benefit of shareholders. And then the company looks for an acquisition to either merge with or take over where the target gets the benefit of the use of their cash, as well as the opportunity to be publicly listed as part of a business combination. So if you're a private company, either from venture capital field or from LBOs or uh, a division of a, a, a public company, and you want to go public, you can either go public through traditional IPO routes where you can merge with a SPAC. And then to the extent that shareholders approve the transaction and are excited about it, the proceeds from the cash would then end up on your balance sheet as part of your cash. Just like you get IPO, you get cash proceeds. However, shareholders of the SPAC can vote in favor of the deal, but choose not to participate in the merged company. They can say, you know, I know that there's cash in a trust account and, you know, I don't really want to participate in the deal. I want my cash back. So they can redeem their shares, like a change of control provision in a bond and get their cash back. So today, if you buy an IPO or a secondary piece of a SPAC for the shares themselves, you you get the ability to get your trust amount back which is typically $10 or more per share. And SPACs are typically issued at $10 a share. Or you can participate and roll into the new deal. And it really depends on which one you like. And you can do that. Now, let's say the people that have the SPAC don't find a deal very quickly. They actually have an expiration date. There's a liquidation date that requires the public company to find a transaction or liquidate. And if they liquidate, again, the proceeds in the trust account go to the shareholders of the public company, so they would automatically get it. So if the trust account has $10 or more in trust and it's invested in treasuries, and you get the benefit of that interest in treasuries, and you buy it below the value, which is $10 or less, By definition, what you really have is you have a zero coupon bond with a fixed maturity of two years or less because liquidation date currently is about 15 to 18 months, but typically it's two years or less. And if they announce a deal sooner, you get your money back sooner or you can participate in the deal or people are so excited. It's the next DraftKings. It goes up a lot and you get or or the next DWAC, Donald Trump media empire. It goes up a lot. You get to participate. Um, so if you buy it at or if you buy it, you sort of have this convertible bond like security. And then obviously, once the transaction's approved and you roll into the deal, you have a more traditional small cap or smid cap stock. It seems to me like investing in these SPACs is almost like a bet on management for them to go out and find a good deal. I'm curious. Since shareholders are able to redeem their units or shares for that usually $10 price target. Why is it that they ever trade below that? So first of all, it may or may not be in a, a bet on management. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of conversation about actively managed SPACs and picking the right management team. Um, yet the most successful SPAC in the history of SPACs, and I've been doing this since 2005, um, is probably the Donald Trump SPAC that was done by Digital World Acquisition, DWAC. And that management team, uh, maybe others would find this offensive, but I would call it on a scoring chart, a mediocre team at best. Uh, They were investment bankers uh, that were okay investment bankers. Um, Their first SPAC liquidated, so they didn't have a history of very successful SPACs. What they did was they were able to find a deal um, off the beaten path, which I'm sure many weren't interested because of the geopolitical inner fighting in our country, this is not geo, it's just politic fighting. Um, and there's a brand evidently, and they were able to latch onto it. 
uh, whether ultimately that that company is successful or not is a different investment decision post merger and even now where it's trading above trust value. Um, so I'd like to say that expertise and being around the hoop and knowing management makes a big difference. Um, it may or may not. And one of the reasons it's not as important, and I do want to emphasize this, is when you buy a SPAC, you have the right to redeem your shares. So you can buy it like a yield product, a short-term yield product, one year, 10 months, uh, or longer, but no longer than two years, right? And you can buy it at a discount to the trust value, locking in a yield like you would with commercial paper or money market securities. And you have treasuries at your credit risk. And the management gives you that opportunity to potentially capitalize on a return in excess of that future value, present value, zero coupon equation. Now, you ask, why do SPACs trade at a discount? So typically, I didn't cover this in the early conversation, SPACs are issued in the IPO as a unit. So you're given a stock and typically a warrant and order right. So the warrant is typically struck at eleven fifty a share because the SPACs issued at $10 a share. So it's a 15% premium. And that warrant typically is a five-year life. And there are people that just want to buy the warrants. There are people that just want to buy the stock. And there are people that want to own both. And the warrant people are actually making much more of a um, an investment on the confidence of the management team of the SPAC of finding a good deal because the warrants have no value if the company liquidates. Only the shareholders have that right to the trust account. And they have no redemption right. So if you own a portfolio of these warrants, it's almost like owning a portfolio of venture capital investments. And I would recommend if you're going to be a warrant buyer, you might think you can pick the best warrants, but remember they haven't announced the deal yet. And even if they announce a deal, you might think you're a great venture capital investor. But what I've learned since my investment world, going back to my beginning career, 1984, 85, 86 period, and being tutored by Joe Steinberg, was if you're going to do venture capital, you want a big portfolio of it. So I would recommend if you if you buy the warrants as a focus, think of them as a portfolio of options. Um, on the stock, it's very different, right? You can, you can capture the fixed income like nature due to the redemption provision, the liquidation provision backed by treasuries. Now, I didn't answer your question on why do the stocks trade at a discount? They traded at a discount because of, because of two reasons. One, it's like any bridge financing, right? You need to get paid something to tie up your money. There's an opportunity cost of capital. And two, it's not very interesting if to invest in a stock betting that the stock's going to announce a good deal in this, and then it's going to go up and make a zero return on my capital. Now, there was that period, I call it the mean period, between Labor Day of 2020 and St. Patrick's Day of 2021, to be simple, where SPACs did trade above their trust value. And I don't mean the units, I mean the stocks, because they were paying a premium to get into those potential great deals. You know, I'd rather like to know what the deal is and overpay for it and miss that first pop knowing what I'm getting and get a return on my capital while I wait. Um, they're not exactly call options, right? Because you're putting up the full capital. You don't get the gearing or the leverage you do want a call option. Uh, never in the history of SPACs since I've invested, again, since 2005, I know I repeat myself, did I see anything where it traded at a premium other than that SPAC mean period of Labor Day to St. Patrick's Day. That is an anomaly in my opinion. They've traditionally traded a discount to reward investors. And in fact, as interest rates have started to go up, the amount of yield you can lock in or the bigger the discount has occurred. Why is it that some companies would rather go through an IPO process through a SPAC rather than, you know, the traditional IPO process that, you know, requires more regulatory kind of hoops to jump through? Well, you answered your own question, right? More regulatory hoops means more headaches. That may or may not be the case, by the way, but yes. So the, re the one of the distinct uniquenesses or differences of a SPAC versus a traditional IPO is a SPAC is viewed as a business combination or merger. 
And the rules for mergers and business combinations from a disclosure standpoint are different than a traditional IPO. Now, it may be that the SEC decides that that's an unfair playing field, and they may change those rules. But if they do, they're going to have to affect the rules of mergers as well. So I'm sure we're going to get rules. I think the rules will only make the asset class, the SPAC asset class, better, sounder, and more beneficial for the investor. That being said, look, you can do direct listings now, which you couldn't do before. You can do traditional IPOs. You can do SPACs. And don't forget, you can also sell to third parties. This may be a way that's a little less expensive for people to put their company up for sale by merging to a SPAC and seeing what comes up. It traditionally has been quicker to get into the public market via SPAC. That's not necessarily the case today because the SEC is so backed up. But it is still traditionally a quicker way. Um, It allows more information to be provided to the underlying equity investor to encourage them to get excited about the transaction. And with that has the benefits of you get more information and the negatives of buyer beware, right? But um, it has that benefit. And also it's, it's immediate. And what they really like is you've already paid for all of the public stuff, right? The, the, the SPAC has. So the prize is the cash, right? They're going in for the listing and the cash. And it's that simple. You know, University of Chicago recently came out with a academic piece that discusses some of the merits of SPAC as a capital formation tool. And one of the reasons we, even though I've been investing in SPAC since 2005, and I invest in the entire product lifecycle from the sponsor capital, who are the guys that put up the risk capital to get it public, to the IPO, to the fixed income like nature of SPACs, to even at the end of the day, providing the capital, additional capital called pipes, private investments and public equities that provide additional cash in case the SPAC gets redemptions or just more cash. It's a form of pre-merger capital formation. Uh, or even afterwards, right? even though I have that long history, um, I never thought it could be a single asset class to manage money around because it was too small a market. But it's gotten adopted by real institutions. right? You have hedge funds like Elliott. You have venture capital, private equity growth firms, and investment banking firms like Warburg Pincus. You've got Apollo. You've got Aries. You've got Cerberus, who's a traditional distressed opportunistic investor. You have um, Hamilton Lane, an investor that invests directly co-investing in private equity and venture capital, as well as with those organizations. And those are just some. Those are our traditional Wall Street firms. Then on top of it, you have people like Bill Foley, right, who has built a successful entrepreneur doing this. You have other successful entrepreneurs willing to issue SPACs because they have a network and knowledge and see undervalued opportunities to try to take public. It's become an institutionalized product. So because of that, we've been able to actually launch a single asset ETF on SPACs, just as others have. Ours is called uh, Crossing Bridge Pre-Merger SPAC ETF, but there are other SPAC ETFs as well that are listed. Um, They're different. You have to read how each approach is different. There are lots of private ec- private funds, hedge funds that are also in the SPAC uh, business and people can do it themselves. So um, it's a big enough asset class that we we felt we could do a launch product and not to ramble, but but I think people have been concerned, oh, the, the asset class went through the mean period, but it's going to shrink. But, but let me be clear, there's currently 716 SPACs as of March 18th, last Friday, Uh, out there, of which 613 are looking for a target, 103 have announced deals. The total cash value of these SPACs is $186 billion. Now, $186 billion market is definitely a single asset class today. And you can get this information every every week from a a website called SPACinformer.com. S-P-A-C, informer.com, which is an affiliate of ours. And we charge nothing for you to have the privilege of getting free information. But remember, you get what you pay for. You know, I definitely was not familiar with SPACs until the most recent couple of years. So I was surprised to see that they've been around for a number of decades. 
We've seen a substantial increase, as you mentioned, in the number of SPAC IPOs in 2020 and 2021. Do you think that's just due to the excess liquidity in the markets or are there other factors that are driving the just huge increase we've seen in the number of SPAC IPOs? So I'm going to answer your question with something you very rarely hear in the investment world. I don't know. And for me to answer that question would be pure speculation. That said, I think you've seen asset classes outside of SPACs that have also had huge form, huge inflows. The venture capital community and asset class has grown exponentially over the last 10 years, right? The private equity market, which is definitely not due, for decades now has been growing uh, at very, very high growth rates. I think as there is more money flowing around in the United States, particularly, but also the world, either because there's been wealth creation and wealth handed down to others, and there's been increased savings, believe it or not, um, and because of technology uh, improvements and new companies emerging, um, and it's just been a really bullish market, those create um, opportunities to raise capital. I remember... Uh, it's got its negatives as positive, but I remember a period called 2000 and you could raise money for anything that sounded internet-like, right? So people chase uh, growth and, you know, SPACs are a form of, a, of one, allowing one to embrace growth. By the way, I can remember a period where you could buy etoys.com. And the enterprise value exceeded Toys R Us. And we know how that worked out for Toys R Us. And the equity value was very high, yet the convertible bonds were trading below 60. And something's wrong with that picture when lenders are saying, you're distressed and I want mid-teens to high teen yields and low prices. And the equity is like this. Well, it went bankrupt. But but. That just shows that there is in markets where there's new um, technology, new productivity tools, new growth opportunities mixed with capital formation, mixed with a relatively bullish market, how you get very mixed uh, views where credit guys are typically skeptics and equity guys are typically more positive. I couldn't help but looking up Buffett's thoughts on SPACs. And he mentioned how the sponsors have two years to get a business spot, which you also mentioned earlier. He mentioned, you know, if you gave him two years to buy a business, then he would definitely be able to buy one, but it just might not be a great one. And we're huge fans of Buffett and Munger here at TIP. And we like to consider the incentives of the economic participants that we're dealing with. Do you believe there is an incentive for the sponsors to put together a deal just to get their compensation package out of it, regardless if it's a good deal or bad deal for the investors? Wow. There is so much in that question we need to unpack. So I'd like to break in a couple couple points. Um, it's an excellent question, by the way. So first of all, um, I want to address the Buffett comment a little bit, and then we can address alignment of interest, which I think is uh, ultimately where you're headed. So first of all, I'm, I'm a huge uh, person who respects Warren Buffett. Um, indirectly, I've been a beneficiary of, of Warren Buffett's golden touch with my employment for 10 years at Lucadia National and his joint venture with Lucadia, now Jeffries, with Bracadia's multiple opportunities. Um, and he's a brilliant man. I also uh, teach a global value investing class at the NYU Business School with a gentleman named Jamie Rosenwald who started the course. And one of the things we do is cover Buffett's uh, letters as part of our uh, curriculum. And one of the things I do want to tell, which is a complete sidebar to your question, <laughs> is I think people have become very short-sighted in their investing. Um, and this does go to a two-year horizon, which is, I think, what part of what Warren's talking about. Um, they become very short-sighted. And I think that's human nature because I think in general, we've all become much more short-sighted and much more focused on instant gratification. And, and think about technology today. They went from faxes to emails. And before faxes, you had FedEx. 
Well, what did FedEx do? It was a business that said, I'm going to disrupt the postal business because I believe people will pay a huge premium to get a package overnight to respond quicker. Now people are like, oh, FedEx it, send it second day. Well, then faxes came through. Now you have email. So think about the amount of response time people were expected to do and the amount of volume they're doing versus, let's say, just 20 years ago, right? And that's created more of a do it now, get it done now syndrome. And that's just in a simple business example. So look, I think the world has sped up. Um, and that's just a general comment of whether two years is not. But the point of this is, um, if you look at Warren Buffett's returns, which he posts in the history, go back to those early years and look at some of those really big drawdowns he had. And ask yourself, if you were investing with Warren Buffett, would you think long-term or would you redeem? Or would you even say, I'm not giving it because of look at those numbers. But if you would have redeemed or skipped the guy, you would have missed the goat. (laughs) So I I think it's important to look at things in a frame of time and match assets with liabilities. Uh, As far as Warren Buffett's comment about, you know, if you give him two years, he'll find acquisition, but he might likely overpay for it. Well, that that in of itself is a statement that doesn't make any sense because Warren Buffett doesn't overpay for anything. He'll pay fair, but he doesn't overpay. And whether it's two years or 10 years, you know, he's gone long spells of not finding acquisitions, but he also had multiple acquisitions in a short period. I think the ability to find an acquisition is traditional. That makes sense. It's traditionally based on the valuations you can get of acquisitions. And I think it's more a comment that today the world is generally expensive, even as we're speaking, and there's a war going on in Ukraine and the Fed's raising rates and the stock markets dropped quite a bit this year. And people who are unfamiliar with true bear markets like, oh, my God, you know, what's going on? But people your age, <laughs> um, <laughs> another side, I had an investment bank your age was like, the business is horrible. Nobody's doing deals. What do I do? I'm like, you haven't seen anything. <laughs> I'm, he's like, this is the worst market ever. I'm like, you should have been around in 08. Um, so in any event, um, so I think valuation is key. And one of the things I think, unfortunately, that has occurred is you've had an explosion of SPACs that allow capital formation and allow people to go public at the same time that venture capital valuations have been on the high side and private equity valuations have been on the high side in a very low interest rate environment. And when we talk about valuation, everything relates to a fixed income yield. I mean, I don't happen to think the riskless asset is the U.S. Treasury, which we're taught in school. I think it's your mortgage rate because you got to pay it off and you got to live somewhere. But it doesn't really matter, right? So one of the things that's going on right now is we're going through a revaluation period. And that's going to make acquisitions potentially cheaper. But the great companies will still be ex- more expensive. So is two years enough? I think it really depends on the network and the the valuations. And there may be too many SPACs to find that many good deals. I don't dispute that. And I also think that the sellers, if you're a venture capital, you're selling because you can go public at a higher valuation than you can do another round of financing and you probably need cash. Right. And private equity, you're going to delever at a higher valuation. But private companies have always gone public because they thought that was a cheaper capital formation than doing a private funding. Um, But I think it's important when you look at deals that there are going to be a lot of overpriced deals. The other thing I want to comment about Buffett's comment is you're dealing with a man who he just announced he's buying Allegheny, I think, for $11 billion. The general SPAC total enterprise value is about one to three billion. So this is like an, a rounding error, right? So, so we know that as you look at smaller transactions, in theory, in theory, you should get paid more money. You don't always, but you should. So where does that lead? And then we'll go to alignment of interest. The targets are out there. It is highly likely that most SPACs will overpay for these targets, which has always been the case. 
just like most IPOs don't go up and continue to go up, right? Because typically it's an arbitrage realization between private values and public values. It's why I hate comp analysis or comparative analysis. I want to know how much money can I take from the company and either buy back my shares or distribute to shareholders so my piggy bank gets bigger. But a multiple to revenue of 10 times where it's losing, you know, 30% on its revenue a year is not a great business, I understand. Doesn't meet my value metrics. Now, as far as alignment of interest, it's a problem. Right? Why is it a problem? Well, let's start with the biggest problem. When SPACs are taken public in an IPO where the cash goes into the collateral account and they're looking for a deal, that capital to get it public needs to come from somewhere. So if you're doing a $200 million IPO of a SPAC, it's going to take somewhere between eight and $15 million of risk capital to actually just get the SPAC up and running and build a team and go look for the stuff. So, I mean, the 200 million is going to go into a trust account and it might even be more than 200 million because they might take 204 million, right? So that means of the 12 million that the sponsor's putting up four is going to the trust account for redeemers or liquidation. That means there are other 8 million is what's eating up their costs that are cash payments as well as future. If they don't find a transaction or they find a trend and they don't close it, they lose all the risk capital. So a SPAC sponsor's primary focus is finding a deal to close, period, end of story. Because if it liquidates, he loses everything, or excuse me, the sponsor loses everything. So they're incentivized, good, bad, who knows? Just get the deal done. Now, the other part is most sponsors syndicate that risk capital. So you can actually have sponsors who have practically no skin in the game from a capital standpoint, but share a significant part of the proceeds of being the sponsor, right? That's even worse of an alignment of interest. Now, we haven't talked about what the sponsor gets. This is the egregious part. A sponsor who puts up this risk capital, so my example before was $12 million on a $200 million deal, which is pretty high, but it's assuming a SPAC is collateralizing a $10 IPO with, call it, you know, 10, 20, or 10, 30 in trust. So the IPO sponsors locking in a 2 to 3% gross yield just on the cash collateral before the value of the warrants, okay? Which we haven't talked about, but let's focus on this. So they put up the risk capital. Well, they need something for this. And if they're going to syndicate it, the guys who are buying the syndicate need something. So in SPACs, the sponsors typically get 20% of the value of the IPO if they do a deal. That means if it's a $200 million deal and it trades at $10 a share, they just made $40 million of value. They didn't make it minus their cost. Okay, so they made $28 million in my example. It's pretty good gearing. And they still get warrants, so they could make more. <laughs> and if it trades at $5, they still make money. Their break even is usually around, depending on how they syndicated or didn't syndicate it, but it's usually between two and three dollars a share. So if the SPAC trades above three bucks, they're probably making money. That's another problem with the alignment of interest. So now we've covered the now the sponsor does will argue, I have to find the deal, I don't get paid to find the deal. There's costs, I eat it, I'm taking all the risk. Oh, and by the way, everyone knows these economics I'm dealing with because they're publicly disclosed. So here's what happens. When I find a deal, the target says, oh, I'll take a little of your sponsor shares. And then when they go raise the pipe money or the additional capital to support redemptions and additional capital, they'll take a little of the founder shares. Doesn't matter. It's, it's, if you think about the fee, it's almost more egregious than hedge funds. Most who don't even hedge. Okay. So um, that's problem one. What's problem two? The companies that are selling want the best price. They're not interested in creating value generally in a cheap price. That's true in an IPO as well, by the way. But I think the difference is in an IPO, I think there's a little bit more of a commitment to try to price it more fair. 
right? Because you're not giving so much up to some group that isn't part of it. You're giving it to investors directly. In addition, you know, you have to think about the consequences of the, of the mergers, private equity, I mean, the shareholders. So take BuzzFeed, which we participate in anchoring the pipe, which is a convertible bond. You've got shareholders that are now suing BuzzFeed. These are employee shareholders, shareholders who worked at BuzzFeed, who got shares for working there, arguing they got locked up and they didn't have enough time to get out at a good price. So there is an alignment of interest problem. Okay, let's go one more. Investment bankers, lawyers, and accountants. Now, the accountants actually don't charge a lot, but those investment bankers charge a lot. And what's where do they charge? They charge for the IPO. And many of them defer their fee until the IPO finds a deal. So they're already now tainted. Then you've got the investment bankers who want to help you find the target. Then you've got the investment banker raising that represents the target, right? By the way, you have lawyers for all these things too, okay? Then, right, you have the investment bankers focusing on the pipe and you have lawyers there, right? So there's a lot of hands grabbing, you know, and there's the old joke, you know, you go to the you go to the the docks and they show you many yachts and they say and they say this is JP Morgan's yacht. Let's do modern day. This is this is Blankfield's lot at Goldman Sachs. This is, you know, Larry Fink's yacht. You get the idea. And somebody says, Yeah, but where are the clients yachts? So that's a problem. And to give you an idea, it's not unusual to see 20 and $30 million fees in the merger to cover all this. Well, it's a billion dollar enterprise. You just took 3% out. And going back to Warren Buffett, something brilliant happened just the other day. He announced he's going to merge with Allegheny. He's going to buy Allegheny. And he said, but investment bankers don't add enough value. Now, I like investment bankers. So they bring me deals. So I'm very happy. You know, I don't want to beat them up too much. But he said, Allegheny, you want to pay your investment bankers? That's fine with me, but it's not coming out of my pocket. So I'm paying you X per share, and you're going to reduce that share price by what you're paying the investment bankers to your shoulders, but not to me. Right. And it was actually a pretty reasonable number. People should go look at it. He was going to pay, I think, 250, and the number is going to come out now at, I think, 248 something. I don't remember the terms, but you've got a lot of, People with looking to make money. Um, yeah, that's true in IPOs too, but I don't think it's any different in IPOs. There may be less parties involved, less transactions, but you've got, it's a, it's a problem in the Wall Street environment in that when a lot of money's there, you figure out to charge lots of fees and you say, well, it's not a big number. So it's a long-winded response in multiple parts to your question, but I think it's important to cover a lot of things. And I think as a value investor, And a part that we cover in our class in NYU, we spend a lot of time on alignment of interest. We actually use the law school next to the business school as an example where you don't have an alignment of interest because when you hire a lawyer, they're not really interested in saving you money. They want to continue representing you for a long period of time. Hey guys, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Trade Coffee for supporting the Investors Podcast Network. I've always had trouble finding fresh coffee at the grocery store because a lot of the time it has been sitting on the shelves for weeks and eventually goes stale. Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans from America's best local roasters. They deliver right to your doorstep with free shipping as often as you'd like. I got started with Trade by taking their simple quiz online. It was super easy as they asked me a few questions such as how I make my coffee, whether I'm a coffee expert or beginner, and if I add milk or cream to my coffee. The results matched me with the Nebula Dark Roast. And let me tell you guys, I cannot get enough of it. It was roasted right here in the US in Oakland, California, and it has a comforting and rich taste with added honey to help me satisfy my sweet tooth. Another reason I love Trade is because they support small businesses and ensure they're sourcing their beans from sustainable sources. Trade has delivered over 5 million bags of fresh coffee, and they have more than 750,000 positive reviews. If that isn't enough for you, Trade literally guarantees you'll love your first bag too, or they'll replace it for free. 
Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let Trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off your first order. Yeah, I completely agree that the incentives don't really seem to be aligned. And the 20%, you know, you mentioned just seems egregious. Um, With that, you know, what you typically hear or read in the news is that SPACs are risky, speculative investments where you can lose a lot of money. You, You know, you see these deals where some of these companies are doing zero revenue. And, you know, back to Buffett, Buffett is one that has been someone that, you know, has completely avoided IPOs. Now with that, let's transition to Crossing Bridge. You guys approach the space much differently by focusing on pre-merger SPACs specifically. Could you tell us a little bit more about pre-merger SPACs and what makes them different from what we, you know, usually see in the headlines? So nothing would make me happier than spend some time talking about pre-merger arbitrage and SPACs and how it's a fixed income-like strategy, and even better, how to how to inform people of our ETF, the Crossing Bridge Pre-Merger SPAC ETF. Before we do that, though, I do want to address two things. Uh, I, I don't know if Warren Buffett's ever bought an IPO or not. Uh, I'll take your word for it, but I will tell you that Warren Buffett also never bought tech stocks, and now he does. So. I think it's not that there's necessarily hard rules in the sand. I think people have hard rules, but an inquisitive person who's mindful and disciplined also recognizes that sometimes things change. Um, So that's one. Two, there are actually very few SPACs that have zero revenue. Um, And if they are, they're typically uh, SPACs that are more like drug development um, which you also see in IPOs, by the way. That said, there are a ton of overpriced, mispriced SPACs, which is going to work to your your re, your listenership in that a lot of them are value investors. Go to the SPAC market, look at all those SPACs that were done, and now look at their prices today. I mean, Casper, which we've all heard, it was a SPAC that was done, right? Stock collapsed, rightfully so. Company did 100% the right strategy of, realizing that you can't be direct to consumer without having bricks and mortar in the long run to meet a most addressable value. They raised convertible bonds. You know, the business model has real issues. The stock dropped below three. They're taking it private. I assure you, they'll rationalize their marketing and they'll make money as a private company, right? Because as a public company, they were using other people's money and the cash they raised but as a private company, they're going to conserve that cash and rationalize it. And, and instead of focusing on growth, focus on cash flow. And I think you're going to see all kinds of opportunities in post-merger SPACs. I, I don't want to pick names that we're looking at. Um, we can have a separate conversation or podcast about it, but there will be those opportunities. It'll also be a great vulture investor market with all the convertible bonds and fixed income pipes that are being done. Um, but I do think it's it, it, it's it's a mistake not to look at the aftermarket as a potential value opportunity. Unfortunately, there'll be a lot of stones you have to turn over before you may find one. And the accounting is not generally as good and the disclosure is more marketing-based. Now, that's not what we do in most of our funds. We're fixed income. We're extremely disciplined. I actually joke with people and say, we're like a paint-by-numbers person. You know, everybody's trying to find in my profession, like the greater good of managing money. You know, I'm not sure it's like being a doctor where you save lives. I'm not sure the greater good of managing money to make money on money, but it's a living. I really like it. So I think my art is a paint by numbers picture or, or, or artwork. Why? Because in paint by numbers, right, there are rules. And if you follow the rules, you'll get a pretty good looking picture and you got to stay within the lines. So that's about being disciplined. Um, Specifically in that regard, 
And I think it's important when we talk about it. There is a strategy. We did not create it. It's been around for a long time. We're a follower, not a creator, but it's called pre-merger SPAC arbitrage. And it's very simple. It's because SPACs have a liquidation date. And if they announce a deal, you can choose not to participate and get your money back. In both cases, you get what's in the trust value. And the trust value is generally T-bills. And you get to vote on whether they do the deal or not. And they've separated the put feature from the vote. So of course you're going to vote for the deal because you want to get your money back, right? Why would you vote against the deal and let the life of the SPAC continue? And that's also a misalignment of interest that originally you couldn't do that. In the early SPACs, you had to vote for the deal or against the deal. And if you voted against it, it kept going. Or you could, you were basically voting to get your money back, right? They that Sponsors didn't like that because it cut the life off. Um, this is very early, right? So if you know that your credit risk is T-bills and you know what's in the collateral account because they give it to you every 10Q, it's publicly available information. And basic math can tell you how to divide the trust account by the number of shares. I mean, if you can't do that, you probably should outsource your investing. Okay, so now you know how much you have per share in trust. You know what the market price is of the stock. I'm not talking about the warrants. There's a discount generally, right? And you know what the liquidation date is. And by the way, now that rates are finally going up, you'll earn interest on those T-bills. They typically invest in six month or less T-bills. So if it's a one-year SPAC, they invest in a ladder to six months, when they reinvest, if they haven't found a deal, you're going to get a higher rate to that. All right. So if a SPAC and when they do the IPO, they're all over collateralized today. They didn't always. So today, I'm going to, a SPAC, let's take a new issue. Today, this last week, there was a new issue. They issued $10.25 in trust and you paid $10 and you got a unit. So you got a two and a half percent gross yield. Plus you got the warrant. Now, when you sell the warrant, if you choose to do that, your stock price is going to go down by pretty much what you sold the warrant for, right? But since you're going to be able to get it back when you put it or liquidate, you'll get the money. You're getting money to that. You're, you're, you're selling something that, you'll, that, take, that, that gives you money today, right? But you'll have a mark-to-market hit. But when you liquidate or redeem, you're getting it at par. So warrants today are like half a warrant. And the life of this thing is typically 15 months. Okay, so I've gotten 15 month or a year and a quarter maturity, two and a half percent gross yield, plus a warrant that's worth one to one and a half percent when I sell it. That's 4% or three and a half percent for 15 months. I'm making more than 3% in cheap bills. I have mark to market risk. But you know, if I do the math right, I'm disciplined. And by the way, they announce a deal in six months and close it in six months. I put it double my return. Right, six and a half, six, seven months, seven and a half months to be exact. So the fixing of nature is that discount with the intent that you're always going to redeem, or if it's Donald Trump's deal, you're going to sell. But once it's pen, once it's trading above trust value, it's a different analysis. So, you know, Donald Trump announced this deal. We were out by 11 o'clock that day. I didn't get the 60, 80 dollars a share. I'm stupid. You know what? That's not what we do. What we do is, oh, it's at 19? That's $9 above trust? Sorry, we're out. That's what we do. So, you know, if you do SPAC arbitrage, you have to always redeem and make sure you do it properly and check your record dates. You have to be prepared to liquidate. You have to be able to, if you're going to use leverage or you need cash or your asset liability match, you have to be able to hold to maturity because there is mark to market risk, especially since hedge funds leverage these products four times, five times, six times, seven times, eight times. And, you know, one day you might get a tap on the shoulder and see those spreads really blow out. And you can decide to sell the warrants or not. We always sell the warrants. So in our product, the Crossing Bridge Pre-Merger SPAC ETF, S-P as in Peter, C, SPAC without a vowel. That's what we do. We say it in our perspective. We're going to buy at our below collateral value. We're going to redeem or sell or liquidate but we're not going to roll. So that's what our fund does. It, of the, there are other funds. There's an a ETF called CSH, which is by, um, uh, it's a, a joint venture with uh, Morgan Creek and another firm that just started. And there's Robinson SPAC ETF. Um, 
I believe our prospectus is the most transparent um, and is more specific about, you know, the rules. Uh, we're the largest of the three and our bid ask spreads a penny, which is the tightest. Um, and we're also, right, so, but there are others. Quite frankly, you go to spacinformer.com every Friday, you can download the database. It'll tell you the last market price, the expected liquidation price, the expected liquidation date. Are they seeking or do they have a deal? And what those yields are. And you can do it yourself. So you can be a fisherman or you can go buy your fish at the market and buy our ETFs. There are other SPAC ETFs that, that may say they're doing what they're doing, but have the ability to participate in the deal. There are even SPAC ETFs that only do the deal things. But ours is 100% focused on below trust account liquidate or sell or redeem, don't roll and capture that discount. Now, what does that mean? Are we going to outperform? I'd like to tell you as an active thing, we're going to outperform than if you do it yourself. But who knows? But if you do it yourself today, $140 billion of the SPAC market, according to SPAC and former, are trading at yield to liquidations of greater than 3%. So, yeah, is 3%. And by the way, the average maturity on this is probably about 11 months. So, I don't know, 3% for 11-month money backed by treasuries? Oh, most of it's capital gain? Not ordinary income? Sounds pretty good if you want to, if you, if you, if it's, what, what are we in? We're in March? I have a kid going to, let, I don't, but let's say you have a kid going to college in September, well, you got tuition in September, you got tuition in, in January the following year. You know, let's take the January tuition. You could go buy a portfolio of SPACs, make 3%, most of it capital gain, right? As opposed to ordinary income. That's a lot better than a CD, right? A lot better than a T-bill, a lot better than a money market fund. And if you're an ultra short duration fund, you got wiped out when you didn't expect to right at the moment. So, because of rising rates. So it's a really good sort of long-term cash alternative. Now, warning, you know, warning, warning, warning. Um, who are the investors that buy the pre-merger SPAC ETFs? By the way, traditionally, nobody rolled into the deals. Almost always they redeemed. That's the traditional history of SPACs. And who traditionally been investors who are today? What you would expect, merger ARB guys, convertible on ARB guys, High yield investors, distressed investors, right? These are the hedge funds with some of the sharpest trading elbows, right? And they're levered. They're levered four to one, five to one, six to one. Millennium's in it, Citadel's in it, right? You know, so you do run the risk that liquidity premium, which I still isn't thinking, even today is not being valued enough. And I am concerned today with what's going on geopolitically with Ukraine and China and all that, that there's counterparty risk that isn't properly being considered. I mean, I just read today something about uh, the European banks, you know, are looking at the $100 billion of exposure just to Russia. Okay. The market hasn't seized up. Hopefully it won't seize up. I don't, I'm not predicting it will seize up. But if you just have a bad market, no big deal. And SPACs have held up really well in a rising rate environment and a tough take. But if you get liquidity events that are, that are counterparty related, like 08, you're going to see SPAC pricing drop because people won't get to pay more of a premium. And believe me, there's a price that's going to stop dropping because at some point, Warren Buffett for the insurance company will buy SPACs if he can buy treasuries at 6 and 7% for one year. So... Um, if you're going to do this, be prepared that you could have a drop and in this environment, maybe not get fully invested in them, right? Thinking you can have some dry powder. Um, but that being said, it's a good alternative. I mean, again, a lot of these hedge funds have four, five, six to one leverage in them. So if they get a tap on the shoulder, it's going to have the least price decline to de-risk, right? So we haven't seen that. I will tell you in 08 and COVID, the drawdowns, existed. They were not terrible relative to a high yield book or even an investment grade book during COVID in the first, before the Fed came to the rescue. 
Um, but you also remember during COVID, I could buy defeased municipal bonds, bonds that were municipal bonds called that were backed by treasuries at 7%. Sorry. So if I'm understanding this correctly, you know, there could be a drawdown in the price of the SPAC or your initial principal, but if you hold it out, you're eventually going to be able to redeem it for the share price. Am I understanding that correctly? Exactly. You know the saying in value investing, value will earn out? Well, here you have an you have a exit date, you have a termination date, you have a, a guaranteed date you're gonna cap you, you can crystallize getting your money back. And you know you're gonna get your money back unless treasuries default, in which case maybe they won't get your money back, as long as you properly redeem or make sure you liquid it. Mm -hmm. So are there any risks you know people should consider with this sort of pre-merger strategy i like how you're able to protect your principal but kind of give you this venture capital type approach where you're giving yourself some exposure to that upside such as what happened with donald trump's back so i'm curious are there any risks at all that people should be considering in this strategy there are risks there's no free lunch i haven't found anything that's risk i even think there's risks in t-bills right we can talk about that but and I, I mentioned in a Wall Street Journal article risk, look, one of the risks is you could have sovereign government U.S. Treasury default risk. You could have the risk that you have a bad actor as a sponsor for some reason, which would make no absolute no sense, maybe put into bankruptcy. Uh, it wouldn't make sense. It might not even legitimately be able to be put in bankruptcy. There's no rhyme or reason how this would work out. I think there's an extreme, extreme potential of this. It's not an event I'm concerned about, right? And then the bankruptcy court has to argue, are you adequately secured or is it a contractual obligation? You're talking about a lot of technical nuances, but it's an example of a risk that people take that one should understand um, and just either accept it or not accept it, right? But I'm not concerned about this risk. And there are other risks, right? But I'll, I'll give you a, a, another example. We have a fund that's closed to investors called River Park Short-Term High Yield Bond Fund that's been around for over 10 years. It has one of the highest 10-year sharp ratios in the entire Morningstar mutual fund industry. And it's one of its secret sauces is it buys companies that have refinanced their debt and they've called them, they've redeemed them early. They, they've contractually changed their maturity to take them out where they have to give you 30 days notice. And that's no different than if you had a mortgage and you wanted to refinance it, but you had to give the original lender 30 days notice before you could actually effectuate your refinancing, but everything's lined up and the money's lined up and all that, right? But there is a risk in bankruptcy that 90 days, you're exposed to bankruptcy 90 days after the transaction. It's called a preference period. So let's say in your mortgage in this example, which doesn't have 30-day prepayment requirements, which corporate bonds do, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you lost your job and your wife lost your job and you were over your skis and you got a judgment against you. In that 90-day period, it could be a problem. I've never seen a called redeemed bond file bankruptcy in the history of my career. But it doesn't mean there's not a 90-day preference risk. So I'm making people aware of the risks, but I'm also letting them know there are risks. You know, when I was at Lucadia, we wouldn't lend out our securities to make income because lending securities took on counterparty risk. And everybody thought we were really, really stupid. And the only time you ran into counterparty risk in lending securities in the history of my career of significance was 2008. Then you had a problem. So, you know... You should never say never. You should be aware of risks, but you should be able to judge them. You also mentioned earlier that there are high redemption rates, meaning people are you know, wanting their money back rather than holding the actual shares. So I'm curious why that is and who ends up holding the shares? Is it shares that just aren't issued be since they aren't being redeemed or how does that work? So after a SPAC announces a transaction, there's a record date. You want to make sure you, you own your securities by that record date, not by them post record date, because then you're going to get stuck rolling into the deal. That's one of the risks, by the way. And if you, you have the right to choose to redeem, which means you're saying, I'll take the cash, my proportional amount of cash, and in return, I'll give you my stock. 
So it's almost like the company's buying back their stock for the trust of that. It goes, it's no longer outstanding. It's as if it was purchased or redeemed. So it goes out of float and it goes out of issuance. Um, high redemptions are a function of bad deals. If it's a good deal, nobody redeems because the value of the transaction exceeds the trust account. And those who are planning to practice pre-merger SPAC arbitrage, such as Crossing Bridges ETF SPC, will have sold to someone who wants to own that stock. Gore's brothers have traditionally done good deals. Us Potato Chips is an example of a private company that has been hugely successful as a SPAC that's just a cash flow consumer company, right? But you have DraftKings, you have various others. People came to like. So there are plenty of reasonable companies where they trade above the trust value and um, people want to own them. Right. The problem is you've got a lot of SPACs out there with mediocre sponsors with misalignments of interest that need to get a deal done. And valuations are high. And, you know, at some point there has to be sanity. So high redemptions are really a function of the quality of the deal at the time it's announced from a perception standpoint. I mean, I don't want to pick on Rover.com. I'm sure it's one of your favorite companies. I'm sure you, if you have a dog, you must have Rover.com download as an app. So it's a dog walking app. I know people that walk dogs on the app, but I'm not familiar with the... (laughs) Okay. Well, I I think I may be wrong. So don't quote me on this, but I think it went public at a $3 billion enterprise value. The stock's, you know, trading, I think below three at this point from 10. I mean, I can't imagine Rover.com being worth anything close to that. I'm not even, I don't, I haven't done the work, so I have no idea what it's worth today. Yeah, right it's probably now it's still about a, six bucks a share, a billion dollar oh, valuation. Okay, so I was wrong on the stock price. So it's six bucks a share from 10, and it's a billion versus like three billion. Look, it could be worth that. You know, I missed, I missed most of Amazon, right? So I'm not sure I'm the right guy to talk to about these things, but I understand arithmetic LBOs. It generates cash. I can put it in the bank. I can I can put a cap rate to it like real estate. But you know, why, what's the barrier to entry for a dog walking app? Okay. <laughs> Let's transition to talk a little bit about the general market. You seem to be very familiar and in, in tune with you know what the Fed's doing, interest rates and such. So curious to get your general take on the market for the rest of 2022. Great. So look, we're a bottom-up manager. So most of our views on the world are from being in the trenches, looking at what's happening, and then formulating an opinion of what the world is telling us from being a bottom-up venture. I am not, you know, a Gunlock or a Rosenberg or a Malden or even a Jim Brandt, right? Um, or Jeremy Siegel or any of these financial pundits who really understand top-down. Um, and I think it's important that people recognize their strength and weakness and figure that out. We, we believe when the Fed said they were going to raise rates that they were. I don't know. I think it's probably a pretty safe thing to do. And if I'm wrong, I just underperform. But I, I kind of believe the Fed, particularly this Fed. Um, so we felt the Fed was going to raise rates. And more importantly, we felt the Fed was committed to trying to deleverage its balance sheet. We were less comfortable they how much success they would have, but we felt they were committed to that. And we do think that balance sheet has hedge fund-like qualities. And I would recommend people read Jim Grant's work on the balance sheet of the Fed. But that said, I was much more concerned about the deleveraging of the balance sheet than I am the Fed raising Fed fund rates or ultra short-term rates. Because our rates are already low. We had a yield curve that we felt was going to steepen, and it did last year. And we felt, you know, now it's going to flatten a little bit. And the effect on corporate America, which is in pretty good shape, and the consumer, which quite frankly, currently is in good shape because they can get jobs, they got stimulus checks, et cetera. And yes, I know that half of America is really struggling paycheck to paycheck or worse, but they're actually better today than they were, you know, five, 10 years ago. Um, And this is not a political comment. It's just a, a, a balance sheet comment. Um, and we write about this. So you can read about some of these thoughts in our in our Crossing Bridge 
funds.com website where you can read our commentary. So we came into the year, I think, with a defensive mindset. And the reason I was concerned about the Fed deleveraging was if the Fed stops buying a trillion dollars of securities, right? Fine. So by definition, uh, mortgage-backed securities, commercial-backed securities, asset-backed securities, which is most of their book, Fannie Freddie, which is most of their book, Ginny, Ginny May, right? Those spreads are going to widen because to induce other buyers, which are out there, they got to pay them more spread, right? Because the Fed's the most aggressive buyer. And when your spreads widen out, it doesn't stop it. You know, government agencies and investment rates, it flows all the way through, right? Because if I can make more on a triple A, then I need to make more on a double A all the way down the way. And if they raise rates, in theory, you know, you got to get paid more under cap rate. And the, the, the reason I was less concerned about short rates being raised also is it's a perception thing. Unless it can affect the middle of the curve or the, the five to 10 year or longer, you're not really affecting valuations, just affecting working capital funding, um, which changes margins, but not, not huge. A 1% change in interest rates for somebody who's using it as a working capital margin is not going to affect your aggregate profitability that much, even in high leverage. So it's the balance sheet. So we were lucky. We weren't smart enough to know that Russia was going to put military on the front and then attack. But we were, right, that's luck that we were positioned this way. But the skill was we made a view that when people speak, you should listen. Um, so we came in very defensive. And we've actually bought uh, what we consider really qual- high quality, high yield securities during this. I mean, when, when Russia first invaded, we're, we're a large investor in the Scandinavian market. The Scandinavian market sold off the most when the invasion first occurred in the high yield market. I mean, maybe because Finland, Sweden, and Norway are pretty close to where the action is. But I was pretty sure, even though the Scandinavian countries are more at geopolitical risk, I was pretty sure that my Stolt-Nielsen shipping bonds were going to still ship stuff around the world in a high quality credit. And I'm happy to get paid 8% to August, which is what we paid, right? So we picked away a little bit. Um, so I think it's been, the, 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 the event's been helpful, but our, we're fortunate. Look, our funds have done very, very well. All of our mutual funds and our ETFs have done very, very well in a difficult tape. And had the world gotten nirvana, we would have underperformed. But we made that decision to be defensive based on uh, the facts of what we were seeing by the Fed, the facts that, you know, in order to have long-term inflation, you need wage pressure. We're not quite sure where that's going. That's our opinion, by the way. Final question before I give you a handoff. I just pulled up the a couple inches of the treasury rates here on March 23rd. I see the two-year rate today is 2.15% and the yeah. two-year rate's 2.37%. With the two-year, you know, the rate is accelerating rapidly, meaning, you know, the bondholders are selling off those treasuries is an inverted yield curve where these rates cross something that you're keeping your eye on or is there anything else you're, you know, watching to see, okay, the Fed is not going to be able to, you know, continue to unwind. So there are a couple of things. First of all, um, I think the market is ahead and has been ahead of the Fed's movements. Um, and I think the market's very, very worried about the large increases in prices. Um, and there's no question, even the, sort of bearish oriented people were taken by surprise at the large amount of reaction from the two year and one year part of the curve. And I think there's a Bloomberg article that came out last night. said this is the biggest bond route, fixed income route there's been in the history of fixed income. Uh, And I think they're really talking about the short end of the curve, by the way. Um, And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people parked money as a, as a haven of safety, right? Because the stock market had run so much. And they're the people that have permanently parked it there because they're still recovering from either 08 or COVID, right? That people are really feeling pain. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, the, the, the loss aversion sets in and people, you know, decide they're going to they're gonna sell. What's concerning is not an inverted yield curve. What's concerning is I haven't seen a capitulation trade. Right. So I think SPACs are a great way of measuring capitulation. The SPAC market sort of sideways, call it flat. Maybe it's down a little, but it's called flat since the end of November. 
or since the end of October, actually. Yet the yield as an asset class has gone up. So the yield's gone up. They're relatively flat. Now they're short dated duration. That's a pretty good defensive outcome and you're earning more yield. What you would see in the capitulation trade is where there's a tap on the shoulder, you would see that yield really blow out. You'd see prices, et cetera. You haven't seen that. You know, you, you haven't seen a capitulation. Is, there's been huge outflows in high yield, primarily driven through the ETF, HYG, and JNK. Some in the mutual fund world, but there's been more out of the ETFs than out of the mutual funds. Again, you haven't seen the capitulation trade. It's been relatively ordered. Yes, bid ask spreads have widened a little. Spreads to treasury are down. High yields certainly down, but it's been very orderly. Um, and you haven't seen that. Um, in fact, I think HYG has probably got a greater yield to worst and yield to maturity than the cash market, meaning the underlying securities of that. You have a disparity, which shows more pressure on outflows than the actual securities themselves. But again, investment grade, same thing. Um, but you haven't seen it. So I'm more concerned about where are we in that capitulation trade because I want to be a liquidity provider. I want when people need money, I'm happy. We, we're waiting on the sidelines to provide. In the meantime, we are picking away. All of our funds are earning more return. And, and again, we've done really well. We're, uh, depending on the strategy, we're, we're up. Uh, I think our worst fund's down as of either today or yesterday, 40 basis points. I mean, it's a nothing. So, um, you know, we're fortunate that way. Um, and we've got lots of dry powder. But, you know, the inverted yield curve, we'll see. Uh, I am not a believer that the Fed's going to successfully deleverage its balance sheet and simultaneously do five raises. And the other, the other question is how big the raises. Um, I think they're committed to try to do a shock and awe, but not so much the stock market goes cratering the or the fixed income market goes cratering. So it's it's more talk shock and awe and then follow up based on the market's reaction. And the market is up the two years up 100 basis points since the end of the year or more, right? That's th That means the Fed can raise 100 basis points just to get even where it is. And remember, until the Fed does it, you're rolling down the curve, right? Your two-year maturity becomes an 18-month maturity, becomes a one-year maturity. So I do think we'll get a flattening yield curve. I'm not so concerned about an inverted yield curve. Most inverted yield curves are associated with recessions. That actually isn't always the case. Um, Bank of America came out with something that they said until high yield spreads are 600 basis points or more, there's no indicativeness of a recession. Um, I would argue by the time it gets to 600 basis points, you know, you've missed the foreshadowing. <laughs> um, but I think the thing to look for, I think we're going to get a lot of volatility. I think that what I would advise investors, whether it's equities, um, it's pre-merger SPACs, it's high yield, it's Bitcoin, which I'm not sure, I don't know how to think about. It's, it, I'm just too old. Um, but uh Whatever you do, I have the following recommendations that I think are tried and true is first, know thyself, know what you know and know what you don't know. Two, be disciplined and stick to your discipline. Forget FOMO, right? And also that'll prevent you from avoiding loss aversion because you'll feel good. I mean, I've often said to people, I don't know how much money I'm going to make and how long it's going to take, but I know I'm going to make money because it's a good investment, right? A good investment is a good investment, right? What you can't measure is time and return. But if it's good, it's good. And when it's bad, you got to recognize it. Two, invest in what you know, right? Those are the three most important things. And view, oh, asset cash is a legitimate asset class, but, but view market volatility is an opportunity to exit and to buy. That doesn't mean, and the, and, and, but I don't know how long you can count on a Fed put. And I want to be clear about that. So don't focus on the technicals. Focus on the fundamentals. I think that's really, really important and have a longer term view. I think it's really important. Look, the best example I can give is I don't invest in venture capital myself because, you know, I don't know what to do. I have allocated some family money to venture capital firms. I don't pick them myself because I don't know which one's going. I've done it because I have a fundamental long term belief that we're in the beginning of a huge technological revolution, both in healthcare, in quality of life products, productivity, nothing like what we saw on the internet. I mean, I think it's going to be bounds above that. I'm not recommending, you know, the ARK investment portfolio per se, but I, I have allocated to some um, venture capitals. I stopped allocating to those funds 
uh, several years ago because I thought valuations got stupid, right? So why would I allocate somebody who's now getting fresh money to, to invest in bad valuations? But, but I did several years ago. And I have the one of the managers says to me, did you read my letter? I'm like, no. He goes, well, do you read my letters? I'm like, I never read your letters. He said, but you're an investor in the fund. Don't you want you to know and earn? Wait, don't you want to know what we own? I said, no. He said, what do you mean? You can learn from it. I said, I can't. I said, you're a professional. You're a venture capitalist. I gave you money. When can I get my money back? He said, when I send it back to you. I said, exactly. So in the next five to 10 years, I'll know how we did based on how much you send back to me. And otherwise, I can't do anything. I can't get my money back sooner. I can't make a decision, right? It's not like, oh, I can sell you, right? I'm stuck with you. I made that decision already. So reading your letters is just going to take time and clutter my brain. And I already have enough clutter, right? I need to focus on what I know. So I leave that story to try to help your listeners. David, thank you so much for coming on to the Millennial Investing Podcast. This was such an informative conversation. So I really appreciate you being so generous with your time for our audience. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience go to connect with you and Crossing Bridge? So you can go to our website. You can just type in the word Crossing Bridge Funds and Google will take you to the number one thing. You can go to crossingbridgefunds.com. Uh, you can go to cohansic.com, which is the parent company of Crossing Bridge, um, which also manages money, but not, not necessarily. Um, they're, they're, so they're owned. But Crossing Bridge Funds, uh, you can do a Google search, David Sherman, Cohansic, David Sherman, Crossing Bridge. Uh, you can call us. 914-741-9600. 914-741-9600. Hey, email me. It can be, if I don't know the answer, I'm gonna say I don't know. You'll get a response within a couple within a couple days. It can be, you know, what's your favorite color or when's your birthday? Like my birthday is May 7th and I like lilacs. Um, but email me, David, D-A-V-I-D, it's not that hard, at crossingbridge. Dot com or david at cohanzik.com, which is my primary email, C-O-H-A-N-Z-I-C-K.com. Uh, if you, you'll find us. It won't be a problem. Anyone who can't figure out how to search the internet under pre-merger SPAC, Crossing Bridge, Cohanzik and figure it out, probably shouldn't be professionally investing their money and should hire someone to do it. Awesome. Thanks again, David. We'll be sure to link all those in the show notes. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.